A warm welcome to one and all and to you to this very special um, session of UNCTAD's e-commerce week 2022 with the focus on the three Ds, data and digitalization for development. Well, in this special In Conversation With session, I'll be chatting with UNCTAD's e-trade for women advocate, particularly for the Southeast Asian region. My name is Karen Lam and I will be hosting this session and I am so excited to be able to once again reconnect with my guest. I actually met her about five years ago when I invited her onto my business interview program and I was intrigued by her. Why? For two particular reasons. Firstly, because she is a pioneer in the organic food business in Indonesia. And of course, today we know that this is front and center of the world's attention, particularly when the focus is on health and, um, and food security. And the second reason why I was interested in having that conversation with her was because she was touting ESG goals long before environmental, social and governance goals became a part of business speak that it is today. Well, here is an Indonesian business person who is involved in the downstream part of the food business as a retailer, as a distributor and a marketer of Indonesia's food heritage, but she's also involved in the upstream part of the business as an enabler of the artisanal farmers that she works with and partners. Well, five years later and many conversations in between, my guest has jumped onto the digitalization train and not only has she been able to export her products all over the world, but she's also been able to use technology in a friendly and accessible way to be able to uplift the lot of the farmers that she works with. So it is my pleasure and I am so happy to be able to once again invite back on this platform, my guests all the way from Jakarta, Indonesia, Helianti Hillman of Javara. Hi, Karen. How are Hello. you? Hello, Heli. So, so good to be with you. I remember the last time we talked was um, late last year when you and I were both part of the Indonesian government's program to promote Indonesia's food culture. How have you been since? A lot going on, of course. Uh, I think with the COVID, with the pandemic, we are compelled to grow faster uh, mm. to adapt uh, to adapt uh, much better to it. So exciting and I it's just such a loaded thing for you to be able to say to get us going but let me just for the sake of our audience give everyone a quick context of who you are. Now uh, Javara of course was born about 24 years ago and of course it was a brick and mortar so, business. 13 years ago. 13, 13 years, years. Ah, yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> I think it's 13 years ago, 12 yes. years, 13 mm -hmm. years ago. Yes, as a brick and mortar business. Now, you made inroads into very exclusive farming networks at that time, mm -hmm. and you were able to help the farmers uh, with their methods and their yields. You took those products, you repackaged them, marketed them, and uh, essentially sold them at high-end supermarkets in Indonesia and, of course, beyond as well. So let's fast forward to where we are today. Uh, you've been able to harness the exponential potential of technology, um, both in the upstream and downstream parts of your business. Now, the question is, firstly, what was the pivot for you to go digital? That's very interesting because I think it's an accumulation of interaction that I had and also the exposure, you know, the growth of, you know, businesses like in Indonesia, there is Gojek, which is um, online motorbike delivery, you know, and, uh, and we can see so much how it changed the whole, um, you know, the whole way people are, you know, providing the services in terms of the outreach. So I thought because we are working with tens of thousands of farmers, we are delivering over 600 products, you know, I think it's inevitable that we have to do digital, that the digital transformation is a must to any businesses. And of course, as you say, uh, we started as a brick and mortar business. 
very conservative, very conventional, you know, but sooner or later we realize that if we want to reach out more uh, in terms of how we manage uh, our partnering farmers as well, how we serve our customers, then we have to do it. The question is that where do we start, you know, which part that we start. So I think that's, you know, that's something that, you know, we know that sooner or later we have, you know, we have to do the digital transformation. Exactly. And, and you know, there, there are just so many uncertainties involved when you when you take this almost leap of faith. Right. So what were you perhaps when you started this journey, what were you perhaps most uncertain about? I think it's about the skills set, skill set, uh, because I don't think the team at that time, even myself, you know, have the skill set needed, you know, to adopt and adapt with the digital transformation. So we started with the very simple ones, you know, like starting using the social media, you know, for the marketing. And then we started to look into the enterprise resource planning for the internal operation, because I think it's very important for us to go digital is so that we have a single information that are accurate uh, and fast. You know, we started step by step, actually, you know, um, so and then eventually we started like, aha, you know, we need to go more, we need to go faster. And that's when we started to realize that we have to bring on team that really understand how we can take a more giant leap in terms of doing the digital transformation. Mm. And, and which came first? The idea that, you know, I mean, certainly going digital is not cheap. You have to gather your team, you've got to get the technology, you've got to get the expertise. And of course you don't know what sort of revenue that you're looking at. And particularly with your kind of business, with food heritage, the heritage food like yours, um, how do you balance cost and revenue? So we started very conservative because as you said, yes, we do not have the you know, uh, sufficient financial resources as well as the human capital resources, but we're focusing on how our digital transformation can allow us to have a very effective dashboard on our operation so that we can improve our efficiency. So at least we may not have you know, um, an extreme increase of revenue, but we can cut down the cost because we can manage well the operation because we have an accurate data. Everything is single information, everything is synchronized. And then we start to look, ah, okay, we can start looking into how to, um, um, how to create efficiency in our operation, which area that are not efficient, you know, how to cut down the cost, you know. So that itself is actually sort of like a payback to the investment that we do in terms of, you know, digitalizing our internal process. And then second is on the social media, uses of social media for the digital marketing. Uh, it doesn't cost much actually. So I think almost all small medium enterprises realize that, you know, using the social media is, you know, the most cost effective way to reach out, you know, so that, you know, we do have increase, you know, of feasibility on that. And then the third is that we started to uh, enter the market uh, marketplace, you know, we sell our products through marketplace. So it's not much of investment there, except that, yes, I have to add on one person that are managing the, you know, the e-commerce transaction. But from there, when we started to see there is a 400% increase on our e-commerce, then we started to realize that, ah, this is good. You know, we started to, you know, I think we started to have like a more confident, you know, in terms of investing more. So we started to, you know, add on more team, like, okay, we need to have like a digital manager. We started to have like a copywriter. Um, we started to have like, you know, content creator, you know. So it's a bit by bit, we build it, you know, step by step. And then we, we look through on how does it really affect it, our um, revenue. So 400% growth over a period of? Uh, one year, actually. That's it's amazing. during the it's during the pandemic yeah so it's for our e-commerce so previously either we really have not put enough attention to our e-commerce or probably also the pandemic has you know given us the benefits of you know really uh seeing the changes of the behavior of the consumers in shifting how they do their grocery so i'm curious have you always been this tech savvy no, not, not at all. You know, I always ask help from my husband, from my friends, even from my son. Okay, how do I do this? How do I do that? But I know that, you know, I have to learn, you know, um, I have to keep up with it, you know. So I think it's just a matter of willingness to learn. Um, of course, you don't have to be expert on it. But if you can manage the team that are really expert on it, then, you know, there you go. Yeah, yeah. 
always employ people smarter than you. That's a lot I've been told. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So, so we're talking about the operations, we're talking about that, that downstream part of it. Tell me how the use of technology and digitalization has perhaps helped the upstream part of your business uh, in the way you've impacted the lives of the small scale farmers that you work with. So I'm, I'm a big believer of the power of branding. So one of the biggest missing point on the upstream is that they don't have a brand, you know, our farmers, you know, our food artisan, you know, they're normally, you know, the one that is unnamed, you know, there is, it seems like there is no face, there is no name to, you know, to their existence. So I think this is where the, um, the, the digital marketing really, you know, help us to help them build their branding, the recognition of the consumers, building the relationship directly. So we started to teach them how to use the mobile phone to create digital story of how they produce their things, you know, creating beautiful photo videos so that, you know, there is a connection between the uh, food artisans and the consumers. Because at the end of the day, now the consumers, they want to know more, you know, uh, uh, there is a big trend growing uh, what we call as a mindful consumers, where they want to know where it comes from, who are the people producing that, you know, so by having this digital um, platform, you know, uh, and the social media and, um, you know, even the smartphone, it's very easy for us to help them build the brands, you know, so I think uh, the branding itself allow them to have a better bargaining position and even, you know, among their peers, you know, because normally in Indonesia, farmers consider as the lowest uh, in the in the social status, but now because with the social media, they become sort of like a celebrity because people starting to appreciate what they do and realize that, you know, how hard things that they do, you know, so I think this is a game changer. It's not really about the e-commerce itself, but it's really about putting the name, the dignity, the pride, the recognition to their existence have you ever thought or have you ever experienced a case where you you know you've done you've gone all the way out you've helped these farmers you've 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 equipped them and and you've 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 um, essentially got them uh, up and ready to brand themselves uh, but you know they may perhaps at this point say hey i can do without javara now or they've become so good at it that other uh, uh, retailers would be approaching them and asking them, oh, I saw you on the Javara site, you know, would you like to distribute our products or allow us to distribute your products for you? So could it turn against you? It's very normal. I think in any businesses that always happens, but I think coming back again, Karen, if you remember the mission why I set up the business is about keeping alive Indonesia's food biodiversity. Uh, to make sure that it's not marginalized, we don't lose it. And second is to also build the pride and dignity and the livelihood of the farmers. So if by the enabling activity that we do, they are able to improve. We still have so much homework. We still have so many other, uh, what you call beneficiaries that we can work with. So I think it's it's very normal. So I, I have to say probably, yes, as a business, it will be a different, but we also have our own way in securing our business operation. Uh, but in other way, in terms of, uh, of achieving our mission, then we are there. We're happy uh, and we are there because then the two mission that we have is um is achieved and that's what i love about the work that you do and and about you in particular this this abundance mindset that there is enough for everyone and and you're so clear about your why's why you do what you do and that's that's a gift to the world so let's if, if we were to talk about now um just just to take an overall picture of javara uh say in the next two years um, lots can happen. We are in the post-COVID era and, you know, it, the, the change is really co only constant right now. How, what will Javara look like in the next couple of years, it, particularly when we talk about this hybrid model, which you already have of, of uh, offline stores as well as online stores? What percentage and which part will play a major role in Javara's growth? So in terms of the um, sales uh, channels, uh, I think we, we do have the benefit that we have tried every single channel that you can think of in you know, uh, selling your products, either from supermarket, uh, through e-commerce, uh, through food service, uh, and even to industry. Uh, 
Um, and so right now, basically, still the supermarket are still, you know, probably holding up about 60% um, of our sales. And then there is also a food service industry, the, um, um, uh, the e-commerce and, you know, all these different kind of channel. Uh, but I think in terms of the uh, food, when we're talking about food, uh, yes, there are simple things that you can easily done through e-commerce, but also there is a, what do you call it? There is a human touch to it. There is a taste, uh, which you cannot rely only on the e-commerce or the online. Because with the food, there is a sensory, there is a smell, smell, there is a taste, there is a, you know, there are many things going on. So I think that part of doing the hybrid is, hybrid is very important because I think if you look into like how Amazon are buying whole foods in U.S., so they're big in the e-commerce and then they started to buy supermarket chain that are, you know, um, uh, supplying on organic and natural food products. So you can see that everybody realized that when it comes to food, you know, the real touch and feel on the sensory still needed. So I think a combination of both still, um, you know, still a way to go. Absolutely. And, and what about your, your reach beyond Indonesia right now? Which particular countries are some of your biggest buyers? So um, I think we learned from our mistakes that we should not put um, our eggs in one basket, you know, because with the global, uh, with the global market, there's always issue inflation. There's also, there's issue war, there's issue, uh, you know, uh, natural disaster. So basically I learned, we learned, uh, that we should not put all, all the eggs in one basket. So we started to sort of like um, creating a portfolio in how we develop the market between the domestic market and the export and even the export, you know, we are supplying to five continents and we try to manage that in such a way that if anything flops, if there is anything going on, then we still have, you know, other to hold into or to develop because otherwise it's too risky for us to really focus. But yes, right now we are exporting to over 20 countries in five continents. And what, what, who would be some of the biggest buyers? So uh, it's interesting because now um, the, the you know, so I think this is quite unique though. Uh, we just realized in the last few years that actually the developing countries uh, um, or the one that we might not, um, uh, or uh, we call it as non-conservative market. You know, the, the conservative market will be like Europe and US, you know, that's a very common or Japan, you know, but we started to realize the emerging growth of demand on organic natural food from, um, you know, countries that we did not expect. So we do uh, quite big in South Africa. And now we started to penetrate the uh, Middle Eastern and um, I think we just, um, uh, just, I think just this month, we received a new contract from Latin America. So I think this is really beyond, you know, like, wow, you know, it's amazing. We never thought, you know, uh, that this market that, you know, we thought probably not our priority in the beginning is now catching up in terms of, you know, um, demand for the organic and uh, natural and healthy uh, food products. And how much do you think digitalization has helped you in this aspect of marketing yourself overseas? So basically, uh, definitely because, you know, with the digital marketing, it's borderless. So for example, when we are servicing um, our clients in Middle Eastern, so we use our digital marketing, the ads and everything, everything can be done by, by our team in Jakarta, but, you know, to penetrate the digital uh, marketing in other regions. So I think that's that's the beauty of the uh, digital platforms because you don't have to be there, you know, but you can really be proactive in, you know, in promoting your products and your existence. And I think that's also the reason why we managed to market our products in different parts of the continents because they can access us through the digital platforms. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I'm sure a, a number of people in our audience who are already, if not have, uh, uh, you know, are starting or are already in the digital journey uh, for their own businesses, uh, would you be able to share with them what are some of your contingency plans? Because we know that technology is a double-edged sword. It can be a friend, it can be a foe. What are some of the red flags that you in particular are looking out for that might derail your plans if you were not careful? Um, I think um, we, you, we don't have to do a giant leap. We have to do it step by step. Uh, and we have to make sure that, a, 
you know, I always said that we should address the low hanging fruits first, you know, something that is more manageable. And so once you manage to, you know, kick all these low hanging fruits and then, and then you can start with the next journey. Because sometimes, yes, we want to do everything. Uh, we, you know, we just want to, you know, go fast, but sometimes then it becomes not realistic. So I think uh, it's important to do a self diagnosis on, you know, on making sure that you know where the low hanging fruits are, um, that you're not out of breath uh, during the process in doing the digital transformation. Mm. And uh, just, you know, just being, um, realistic uh, mm. in in doing so but i think it's also very important i think one of the uh, one 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 of the important thing that you have to be careful in terms of because there is so many you know um digital transformation that you know uh, a regular company then become a tech companies and mm. then there is the red flag will be on choosing the right partners mm. Mm. You know, because uh, being a brick and mortar businesses, you know, like you might not have enough literacy or fluency in understanding the context in the digital business. Um, so whenever there is, um, you know, there is an um, inquiry for investments or for partnership in digitalizing or transforming your business, then, you know, you have to be very careful and get the right advices on that. So I suppose you it would be over your dead body if your if Jabara ever becomes known as a tech company. Well, no, well, I, I see tech is more as tools, you know, not the destination. So uh, it, it, it is a means that, yes, you have to use, you know, but I think do not get derailed in terms of where what you want to achieve, you know, the purpose of your business, because our company is a purpose driven business. So we just want to make sure that we we're not getting derailed uh, on that part. Excellent. Let's um, turn our attention now to um, something that's that's uh, pertinent to this particular platform, which is UNCTAD's uh, uh, and, and your involvement with them in particular with uh, E-Trade for Women as an advocate. Now, that's, you know, it's not as if you have that much time to spend and, and you do spend a good amount of your time investing in the entrepreneurs in the program. What is the significance for you between these twin subjects of women and e-commerce? So um, first is that um, I think for women, the existence of the e-commerce and the digital platform open up the opportunity that we might not, you know, uh, have before in terms of you know maintaining the balance between your role as a mother as a wife uh, and you know for you as a business person but I think the digital allow us to and I think of course the pandemic taught us that you know practically you can manage most of the thing at home my son was very happy you know 18 months I got grounded at home and he said like see you can manage things from home you know so um, so that gives us the leverage, you know, we can, you know, we, we can do whatever we want, but yet at the same time, we do have the leniency of, you know, staying home or, you know, do things that we also want to do in our personal um, life. Uh, but at the same time, um, I think the experience with the UNCTAD, uh, which I have in terms of the entrepreneurship, one is that I think it's good the fact that I don't come from a tech uh, world or I don't come from um, uh, e-commerce world. I come from a brick and mortar businesses, a real sector businesses, because then I think we so far we have managed to inspire other uh, entrepreneurs that, you know, probably has not embarked uh, into the tech journey or in the e-commerce journey. And it's like, oh, if they can do it, then we can do it, you know. Um, so I think that's good. And But second, also for me, myself, the fact that the exposure that I get, the interaction that I get with the fellow, um, uh, with the fellow Untat um, advocates, you know, sort of like give me also the confidence, you know, to go further, to go faster. Um, so for example, I think during the two years uh, of my um, participation uh, in the program, so we, we started, um, we launched a um, new platform for Javara, which, you know, we did um, transitioning expansion from a product marketing company into now become an enabling ecosystem company because we already have the infrastructures which other businesses can you know tag along and piggyback which i think we can use it through a digital platform 
And that's your next goal, isn't it? Trying to get other brands onto your platform. Yes, exactly. Because we already have the infrastructure. Um, we already have the, uh, the network, not only uh, in terms of the uh, e-commerce, but also, as I said, the hybrid, the offline, including exports. And it's an infrastructure that all the other brands uh, can uh, you know, make use of. Why are you so generous? Um, because I think my dream and my passion is about uh, participating in the food system change because we do need to have a change, not only in our own businesses, but in the whole system, because it's only when the food system change occur, then you know, we can provide a more sustainable and inclusive economic development for everybody. Well said. So let me end up now with my final question, because time is running out and you know our conversations can go on for hours if we let it, but I have been given 30 minutes or we have been given 30 minutes. So my last question to you, uh, you know, I believe that when you can touch a person's heart, you can hear a person's truth. So this question is essentially about your entrepreneurial journey. What is it about this journey? What lessons have you learned from this journey that you would want to pass on to your son to make sure that he has a higher chance in living well? Um, I think it's a matter of knowing the purpose of life. I think it's very important because that's your starting point. You have to really understand uh, your purpose, your sense of purpose. And um, just simply, you know, uh, challenge the limits, you know, uh, because um, I think the only thing that stops you from achieving anything is you yourself. So basically it's about, you know, how you challenge yourself and how being resilient and uh, being generous uh, along the way, because basically you cannot do it on your own. And if you help others, then you also open your own ways uh, in the process. Well said indeed. Hashtag resilience, hashtag uh, go beyond your limits. So thank you, Heli, once again for your time. And more importantly, thank you for the gift that you are to the lives, the livelihoods of many people throughout Indonesia and also beyond. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Karen. It's been a pleasure and to have a chat again with you. Again, absolutely. And more to come, I hope. Yes. Well, thank you to you, my audience, for joining us on this program and this session. I certainly hope that you take away a slice of inspiration from Heli uh, and perhaps even a jab of motivation for your work, for your lives, and even for the contributions that you make to the community around you. So I wish you a good evening, a good day, wherever you are in the world. Goodbye. <laughs>